excited. Um, we have a really great panel today. I'm going to introduce the panel members to you in a few moments. Um, but um, we're going to hold off on the questions until all of the um, panelists have done their presentation. And then we're going to get into a question period, question and answer and discussion period. So um, please uh, put your questions either in the Q&A or the chat. We'll try to monitor both of those. And of course, we very much encourage you to also, if you would prefer, just put up your hand after the presentations are over and you can you will be unmuted and you can ask your question or make your comment directly. So um, I'm the executive director of CORE, Kathleen Shearer, and I will be the moderator. And I'm just going to give you a brief kind of setting of the scene for this panel with a few slides, and then I'll turn it over to our other panelists. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, bibliodiversity today and um, how bibliodiversity can only really happen if we make some systemic changes in scholarly communications. Um, so what do we mean by bibliodiversity? What is bibliodiversity? Well, it's a state that we work towards. Um, so I think what we, it, it represents, you know, a range of, of, of problems, of epistemic ways of thinking, a range of questions, a range of um, research priorities. It represents, um, uh, an ecosystem that supports sharing those types, those different epistemic knowledge systems, those different types of research priorities. And we can only do that if we support a diverse um, set of, of um, frameworks, of evaluation frameworks, of um, infrastructures, and so on. And one of the other um, uh, characteristics of bibliodiversity that's very important is that the ability to be able to support uh, um, a range of languages in sharing of scientific and research outcomes. So why is bibliodiversity important? Well, a diversity in services and platforms, funding mechanisms, evaluation measures will really allow scholarly communication to better accommodate these different workflows, different languages, publication outputs, research topics. And, and this is really how we can ensure that um, uh, what different communities need around research and um, their discussions around research are supported. So there's been a lot of talk about um, consolidation of uh, um, publishing platforms and so on and uh, services across the research life cycle. And I think what the current situation is, is that um, this homogenization has really led to um, a decline in bibliodiversity in the scholarly communication system. Something that Vandana Shiva calls monocultures of the mind. Um, in April, 2020, CORE published um, a, uh, call for action um, around uh, bibliodiversity to try to raise awareness with the community about the decline in bibliodiversity and um, what uh, uh, the call for action really provides some recommendations for different communities in terms of how they can help with building back bibliodiversity into the system. Um, and I think one of the, um, there are a number of factors really that are contributing to this decline in bibliodiversity and they're all very, very interconnected. So um, I mentioned these already in my introduction, but you know, the dominance of the English language, publishing only in English, the, the, um, the, the pressure to publish only in English, uh, the way we evaluate research based on, um, you know, high impact or prestige journals publishing in those venues. Uh, the very limited funding models we have to fund the services in, and infrastructure around um, scholarly communication and the consolidation of publishing services and infrastructures. And today this panel is really, again, these things are all very interconnected, but um, we're going to focus on um, uh, uh, the concentration of the of services and infrastructures 
and how a distributed system might be able to address some of this, these issues around declining bibliodiversity. So how can we get the right balance? Because this is really the challenge that we're looking at. What we want is to have a system that enables global knowledge sharing. It's very important that researchers around the world can share knowledge with each other. But we also, on the other hand, want to support a system where local relevance, plurality, local research priorities are also supported. Um, many researcher, research topics are global, but also many, many research topics are not global and are domain specific, are regional, or are even very, very local. So what we're proposing here, and, and I think our panelists will try to make the case uh, to you, is that what we want to, to do is have a very distributed infrastructures and services while also ensuring interoperability across those, those infrastructures and services. And so um, without further ado, I'd just like to introduce now our three panelists and I'll turn it over to them to take you through their slides and their, their arguments. Um, our first panelist will be Jean-Claude Guédon. He's um, a very well-renowned scholar in the area of uh, the history of science. And also, of course, um, someone who is well known to those of us who have been active in open access for years. So thank you very much, Jean-Claude. It's a pleasure to have you. Our next speaker is Paul Walk, and he is um, a technical consultant with CORE, and he's the, the head of, of Antley, which is a, a consulting company. And he's also the co-PI on a, a project um, that CORE is leading called the Notify Project, and he'll talk more about that today. Welcome, Paul, and thank you for agreeing to participate in this panel. And our third speaker will be Thomas Guimont, and uh, Thomas is um, the head of PCI, which is uh, um, an open peer review service. Um, P PCI stands for Peer Community In. And um, he's gonna show you a real practical example of how this kind of very distributed uh, system might, might work in practice. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for joining us today. Um, so on that note, I will hand it over to Jean-Claude. And Jean-Claude, please just tell me when I should be going to your next slide. Right now, thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. And welcome to everybody who is watching this uh, uh, seminar or discussion group or workshop. Um, maybe we could go to the first, the next slide right away, um, Kathleen. Okay, so we have a series of diagrams that in a certain way can show us what um, networks can exist and how they can exist. And of course, each one of them exhibits uh, different characteristics, problems, and possibilities. The first one, which I met, I show here is what I call chaos. And actually, if you look at the history of scientific communication and publishing, in the 18th, 19th centuries, for example, to an early 20th century still, you might say that this was the dominant system. Each country had, had a semi-orderly system of publication based on its generally its universities, its academies, and the political system of the, of the country. But from one country to another, things more at best try to imitate each other without giving a particular direction to anything. The only way to internationalize the doing of science at the time was through really imitation or uh, more directly by the first, at the end of the 19th century, the first international conferences that began to exist in that period. One might say that perhaps the first um, world um, fair that took place in London in 1851 would be a, a good starting place for an internationalization of scientific communication, but you can see how marginal and how, how instinctively weak uh, it appears to, to all of us. Next slide. The next one is, of course, more of a joke than anything else, because scientific publishing never took that form and never should. 
this is, of course, the, the, the vision of the Roman turtle that would work in perfect order with complete dominance of, uh, uh, of a political system such as a dictatorship led by Mr. Jules Caesar. So I put it here just to elicit a few smiles among a, a view. For those who don't like to smile, please forgive me. Next slide. The, last, the next slide is probably the most, important, uh, the most important slide for us in the sense that it's going to allow me to explain why mono, uh, the, the monoculture really evolved. The chaos or the chaotic situation that existed until roughly the early part of the 20th century uh, was eventually replaced by something entirely different when after the 20th, after the Second World War, the, uh, the, uh, the, the panorama of scientific publishing changed really radically. What happened really is the result of a number of things. For one thing, the Nazi regime in Germany weakened considerably the German publishing industry in science, which up to then had been pretty well the dominant industry. And that industry kept uh, began to move out of Germany and at the same time began to work in English rather than German. And the second thing is that the, uh, after the war, the, the rate of uh, scientific research increased enormously thanks partially to the realization of what science had done to the war effort. And thanks of course, to the continuation of a warlike situation uh, due to, in fact, uh, the Cold War. So you have a lot of people having a lot of money trying to publish a lot of things. And the society's journals, which were still part of the old chaotic system and national system, simply had a great deal of difficulty in meeting the needs of publication needs and communication needs of the researchers. This opened up a possibility for a publishers to come along and the public commercial publishers. And they began to find ways to, first of all, compete successfully against the societies and eventually dominate the thing, the whole thing. Now, the, for a commercial publisher, the first thing you have to do is to create some sort of market for some sort of object. And they fairly quickly understood that they had to focus on the journal, change the nature of the journal and fit it in, and fit it inside a market which would become international. So the journal with, to go very fast, the journal becomes with the publishers, a commodity, a merchandise, and it is fitted within a, an international market rather than the juxtaposition of national markets. And as, these, uh, as that strategy developed, principally around people like Robert Maxwell and Pergamon Press, for example, what uh, began to develop was the need to secure and reinforce, in fact, to lock up the market situation. And that was made possible uh, in a somewhat unthinking and unanticipated un, un, un manner by the emergence of the Science Citation Index of the uh, period of 1950s and, and mainly 60s and Eugene Garfield. Garfield developed an index, an indexing system, which really was meant at first to help doing uh, bibliographic search in interdisciplinary fields but which had uh, sprouted all around, uh, all around the period I'm talking about after the Second World War. But it, the citation index also allowed people to imagine, and Garfield in particular, to imagine doing quantitative studies of those citations. And out of that, they began to develop metrics and of course the very well-known uh, impact factor. The impact factor, including by Garfield, was presented as a, a tool to be used with great care because it doesn't work the same way from one discipline to another. And um, it doesn't always mean the same thing. It can, people can have a lot of 
um, citations, for example, because simply they have made a very glaring error, which is being corrected very rapidly. But all the same, the metric began to exist as a unifying metric, and that unifying effect really worked on the market. The market became unified around that impact factor, and journal competition began to uh, exert itself around the impact factor. And once you had that, then the, the, uh, the competition with scientists, which were trying to establish the quality of their work, got correlated with the impact factor. And as a result, you had this metric, which allowed you to shift back and forth between the commercial system and the intellectual system. And at that point, of course, the forces to behave in a certain way, to publish in a certain way, in certain venues, with certain kinds of questions, certain kinds of problems, and other things, other dimensions of that kind, all came to the fore, and monoculture of science began to grow. The problem that bibliodiversity is trying to respond to is really the response to this situation that uh, the, the, the commercial publishing world uh, developed and then imposed upon the whole publishing system. So I call this also Beer's dream because there you would go even beyond the present day oligopoly to give us instead a monopoly where Elsevier would be the dominant company and it would in fact direct the whole, uh, the whole uh, system of scientific communication and publication. And can we go to the last slide of my presentation? So now instead what we are proposing is a system of bibliodiversity, which in fact, I mean, is quite easy to understand once you see it as a reaction to the developing situation after the Second World War. What you have uh, with the bibliodiversity is, of course, the ability to recreate possibilities of autonomy within the scientific system so that people can raise issues and questions that are important for them, even though uh, these questions may not be of great importance for other people in the scientific system. In other words, it, you want a system in which even if you are in a weak area of the world for scientific research, you don't have to feel that the orientation of your research should be directed by what is being uh, really commanded from the centers or so-called centers of scientific research. You want something like what I would like to call, if we had more time, I would develop that. You want to develop something like autonomous, semi-autonomous territories of science, which can respond to specific questions which are of particular interest for human groups. And yet, because they are all validated in the same fashion, uh, finally contribute to the creation of this enormous monument of knowledge, which is called science. And because of that, you can reconcile the universality of the scientific processes to validate knowledge, and at the same time, maintain the possibility for various human groups to pursue their own interests and their own, and their own uh, questions, while knowing that even doing that, but is part of the participation in the world's system of knowledge. So bibliodiversity calls for a distributed system which would work with this tension between the universal and the local, which will respond in fact to uh, Nyerere, the Tanzanian president, um, who when uh, statement when he said around 1966, let's not be mesmerized by uh, universal standards, but at the same time, let's be very careful not to do work in such a way that we just look inward and forget about the rest of the world. This sort of dialectics between, between the, the universal and the local is very much part of bibliodiversity. And the best way to imagine how to do so is to really uh, pattern oneself after the lessons drawn from the free software movement where people can answer freely to a wide range of questions 
and at the same time participate in the common effort to develop libraries and, and tools which can be of use to anybody even well beyond uh, what had been imagined to be their range at first and well beyond uh, what the questions uh, had been involved in that development at the beginning. We need an open science, yet a coordinated science, but a freely coordinated science. And I think that's what bibliodiversity really aims at. That's it, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean-Claude. There's already a couple of questions and comments there, but again, we'll um, wait till the end of all the presentations to, to bring those up. So I'd like to invite Paul now to begin and I will... Thank there you, Kathleen. Go. Okay, so I'm going to um, quite rapidly introduce a particular project. Uh, this is the core Notify project, um, which is really looking at um, how we might take advantage of um, distributed resources and distributed systems. Um, so I think I just want to quickly explain our, our kind of what we might call our world view um, in the project. So we're mainly interested in what we call resources rather than systems, um, where resources um, are actually defined as um, anything which you can reach on a URL on the web. That, that's the uh, that's at the heart of what we're doing. Um, if we look beyond the closed world of commercially published journal articles, then actually there is already a range of, of scholarly resources which are um, distributed across the world and in and in distributed systems across the world. Um, so we think this this distribution of resources is is a really important thing. It's it's not a, a problem. It's actually a, a feature and a, an opportunity to be exploited. Uh, next slide, please, Kathleen. So the opportunity, as we see it, is we, we want to be able to connect resources in open access repositories. Core is obviously focused on open access repositories in the first instance. We want to connect the resources which are in those repositories to related resources in either other repositories or um, our focus is actually more on um, systems. Um, and we want to do this in what's called a resource oriented way so a very important um, fundamental principle of what we're doing is that we're not copying resources between systems we're not sending large amounts of metadata around the world we're really all about linking and sending links to resources this allows um, for example a preprint repository to remain as the authoritative source of that resource it doesn't have to give up its preprint to some other platform it, it continues to to be the the authoritative location for that resource and the um, protocol which i'm about to describe works entirely on passing links between those resources and others um, and the, one of the, the real benefits of this, we hope, is to reduce or remove our reliance on particular centralized services. Um, there's a phrase in the middle of my slide there, which is uh, will be familiar to programmers, which is uh, this notion of pass by reference, not pass by copy. This is a very um, fundamental principle in, in um, software engineering in some quarters, and it's very important to what we're doing. Next slide, please, Kathleen. Um, so I'm not going to um, go through these in detail, but I, I just wanted to collect some um, example user stories to give you a sort of sense of what we hope that we can um, accomplish with this. So we'll just look at the first couple, perhaps. So as, as a researcher, so these are called user stories. So they're in a particular format, which is as a particular agent or person, I want to do this function in order to get some benefit. So this is as a researcher, I want to request peer review of a preprint in my local repository and then have that preprint linked to the review and vice versa. This is the classic um, user story that we started with actually, because there is a particular current focus on uh, both preprints and peer review. Um, and people are interested in new forms of peer review or, or enabling peer review in, in new ways. The point here is that what we want to achieve in the end is that the preprints and the and the, the outcome of the peer review are 
bi-directionally linked they're, they're connected to each other they become part of the distributed graph of scholarly knowledge we have other example use uh, user stories there for example around uh, what we're calling endorsements which is more a, a similar process to journals um, actually uh, for example overlay journals accepting preprints um, having conducted some sort of peer review process we have some um, growing interest in the idea of being able to connect um, uh, papers with um, underlying data sets which might be changing over time so there's sort of a, an organic relationship there and there are there are already some um, very similar initiatives going on around um, providing archiving services around resources held in repositories so there's quite a range there but um, next slide please Kathleen so um, I, I'm not sure how clear this diagram is on the on the screen, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that it gives a, a sort of flavour of what we're trying to do here. So, um, a lot of um, our current arrangements with, um, particularly with repository systems, but a lot of scholarly communications arrangements depend on centralised services, and often those centralised services are operating in a um, a sort of batch mode so there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of our services depend on large scale aggregations of metadata which are built by um, periodic harvesting of metadata from uh, repositories and other systems um, and then so that leads to um, a, a reliance on those aggregations and it leads to a, um, a, a pattern where services which want to um, either supply information to or use information from those services are um, either being harvested or are um, if they're consuming then they're running a sort of a query type process this introduces a central dependency and i mean i don't need to name uh, particular services but we're all, all aware of uh, of those kinds of dependencies and that that leads to risk um, we see frequent examples of um, services becoming successful and then being acquired by um, some of the uh, commercial um, monopolies that we, we we're aware of in, in the world of scholarly communications. The diagram on the right is is really trying to show how, with some um, fairly simple, um, essentially peer to peer technologies, which I'm about to describe, we can do away with our reliance on these central services um, entirely um, at least um, in order to achieve the sorts of things which i'm about to describe i think there is still a place for centralized services in certain regards but we have a, um, a reliance on them which is above and beyond the, the, the necessity um, and i hope that i can demonstrate that in, in a moment so this is moving from a, a process of um, which is essentially based around harvesting to a process which is you know about pulling data from all of the systems of the world to a, um, an approach which is about notification it's about actually sending notifications to the systems which need to to know um, and which can be event driven next slide please kathleen so the, the problem, before we come on to talk about the solution, the problem with all of this, of course, is that um, we don't want to have to create, design and create and implement a new integration mechanism every time we want to connect a new service to, to our repositories. We need something which can be easily expanded into new use cases. Um, so the, the problem really is that um, unless we find something like that, then this becomes expensive, it requires um, frequent development effort and expertise, and it also increases what we might call technological debt. So um, every time there's a new protocol or a new arrangement introduced, there's more and more software to maintain. And the resources which we typically have to, to build and maintain these things um, certainly doesn't grow at the same rate that that um, that can grow. So what we're looking for is a solution, which is um, something we can develop once and then expand and and um, and grow without um, a great deal of, of further investment. So next slide, please, Catherine. So um, part of the solution is to use um, public open standards, and it turns out that there are some uh, very neat standards available. 
Um, and the two most important standards which we're using are both from the uh, the W3C, the the consortium, which um, nonprofit consortium, which um, governs the the web protocols effectively. Um, the first of these is called linked data notifications, which is a, a fairly simple standard, um, and it's just really a way of using the main protocol of the web, HTTP, um, to send and receive simple notifications with um, typically small metadata payloads, often just exchanging links, in fact. Um, and there's a diagram there, which um, is the entirety of the architecture of that, really. It just defines some logical components. Um, it's all based around systems having an inbox, which they declare publicly and which can receive notifications. Um, and it's all, as I say, built on HTTP. The other standard which I mentioned there is Activity Streams 2, which is um, essentially a vocabulary of um, the sorts of um, events which uh, they're actually called activities in this standard, um, which um, in a general sense actually um, encompass quite a lot of what we think we might want to communicate between systems. And by using this open standard, we um, maintain um, broad interoperability with the rest of the web rather than creating something which is particular for um, scholarly communications, which is often, um, and in fact has in the past been a mistake in our, in our sector. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So on top of the standards, using open standards, nonetheless, we do need to um, have the ability to um, apply conventions which um, are more suitable to our particular community needs um, and so that's what um, that's what we've been doing and that's been the um, the first major step in this this project is to take those standards and then say how can we use these um, in a way which is optimized for um, the use cases which we've identified um, and that's all being documented um, on a website, I'll give you the URL to that website at the end of this talk. Um, we're using um, an approach of really just very you know, radically open discussion. Anybody can join in. Um, we've had various meetings. We have uh, various open forums where these discussions are happening. And we're trying to take a very pragmatic approach, borrowing from the um, IETF, uh, who have this motto of uh, rough consensus running code, which is Let's just agree on, on on something which we think works, and then build it. Um, that's what we're that's what we're attempting to do here. Uh, next slide, please. Paul, just a couple more minutes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. So the benefits of this, we think, um, system agnostic, um, so no central point of dependency. I think that's the important thing we're we're trying to get across here. Um, being cost efficient. Um, and using those open standards. Those are the three primary benefits of, of this approach. Next slide, please. The ca use cases which we started with um, are peer review of repository-based resources, which I've touched on. This notion of endorsement of repository-based resources, for example, that the sort of process which an overlay journal goes through to um, accept a, uh, a resource, a preprint perhaps, into its, um, into its journal. And then um, a slightly less well-defined use case, which is about integrating uh, what we call downstream services, which are a service which uh, for example, want to know about these kinds of events, the fact that something has been peer reviewed or something has been endorsed so that they can pass that information on to uh, people who have registered an interest in that. Next slide, please. Um, our first phase implementation is um, we have two implementation projects. One, uh, we're working with PCI, who you're about to hear from, from Thomas. Um, working with Epicience and HAL in France to integrate those three systems. And then we have a separate project which has um, just started to develop this um, technology for DSpace versions five and six. That's being sponsored by um, uh, a Portuguese national repository network. Next slide, please. And that's my final slide. So um, if you go to that URL, what you will find there are descriptions of all the use cases, the description of the specification for um, using the linked data 
notifications to pass notifications between systems. And then we've diagrammed and modeled a number of scenarios. We're up to about 10 or 11 now, um, which show in detail how these messages can be passed backwards and forwards. And um, you'll find contact information there if you want to um, get in touch or, or, or indeed join in with this, uh, this project. So I'm sorry that was very rapid, but uh, thank you for listening. That's me. Thanks, Paul. I'll uh, turn the floor over to Toma. Thank you, Kathleen. So I'm going to try to explain what is peer community in. So it's a free recommendation process of preprints based on peer reviews. You can go to the next slide, Kathleen. So we started with uh, the idea that the scientific publishing process currently has problems. There is a big waste of evaluation energy because there are several evaluations for a single article. The evaluation process is too long. The evaluation process also is opaque because there is no publicity of the peer reviews of the editorial process. Uh, the system can be considered pernicious also because uh, the income of some of the publishers depends directly on the number of articles that are accepted. And this may not be good for science. Uh, the system also is considered to be too expensive and too concentrated. If you just consider science, technique, and medicine, there are approximately 3,000 euros as a cost for the society per article, which is a lot of money. And 50% of the articles and citations belong to the big six, big six publishers. And uh, this is true, although uh, researchers do nearly everything for free because they write articles, they edit articles, they review articles, et cetera, et cetera. So next slide, please. So we started to try to find a solution and we uh, started with peer community in PCI. So the goal of PCI is to regain the control of the publication system. It is to promote the reproducibility and the transparency, transparency in science and it is to make publication and evaluation affordable for uh, all. So the principle is to build communities of researchers handling the evaluation to so the peer review and uh, recommending the preprints in their scientific field. So the, the objects that we study are that we, with, that we evaluate are preprints deposited in uh, preprint servers like BioArchive, Archive or SF preprints and also in uh, open uh, repositories like HAL, Zenodo, et cetera. And the communities are PCI ecology, peer community in genomics, uh, peer community in animal science, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the basic uh, workflow of the peer community in is very similar as uh, the workflow in a journal and the evaluation process in a journal. You are an author, and you are uh, pleased with your article, you first have to deposit your data, scripts, and codes to a repository. And you have to deposit also uh, your preprint in a preprint server or in an open archive. And then this is the number two here. You can submit your preprint to uh, one of the peer communities in of your choice, for instance, peer community in ecology. And there it's very similar as in a journal. There is a an associate editor, and we call them PCI recommenders, and there are many of them in each PCI. So one of the PCI recommenders will handle the evaluation of your article. They will invite peer reviewers, and on the basis of peer reviews, the PCI recommender will make an editorial decision. So they can reject your article, they can ask you to make some modifications. So this explains why there is a version two uh, in the preprint server until uh, the last uh, version. And at the end of the process, if the, PA, the PCA recommender is happy, then they, they can accept the article. And this is the arrow number three here. And they ask the authors to post and to deposit a late, uh, a last version of their article with a, a specific format and a specific layout explaining that the clearly demonstrating that the article has been peer reviewed and, and recommended and accepted. And there is also the publication by the PCI recommender of a recommendation text, which is a short text explaining the quality of the articles and the, reason, the reasons why they decided to uh, accept the article. And together with this recommendation text, the PCI website also publishes all the editorial process, so the peer reviews, 
the editorial decisions and the uh, author's uh, response. So next slide, please. So at the end of the process, you have a PCI recommended preprint in a preprint server on the left with a clear display uh, and the clear sign that it has been accepted by the PCI. And on the right, you have this recommendation text and the editorial process that are published on the PCI website. And all this is an open access. It is open peer reviewed. Uh, it is open data and open code. And this is a final, valid, findable, and citable article. So next slide. So at the end of this, the authors of a PCI uh, recommended article have the choice to leave their PCI recommended preprint in a preprint server or in an open archive, or they can choose to transfer their recommended article to the peer community journal, which is a, a, a diamond open access journal in which you can make a direct publication of your P PCI recommended article. Or the authors can choose to submit the article to a PCI friendly journals, and there are many of them, or they can choose to submit the article to any journals that would accept uh, the submission of preprints. Uh, next slide, please. So at the end uh, of the use of uh, no, the, the PCI, the peer community uh, in uh, as a distributed organization, because there are many thematic PCIs working in different fields. There are many recommenders per, per PCI, approximately 1,700 currently, and they all play the role of associate editors and their full responsibility for acceptance of articles. There are many preprint servers and open access repositories with which uh, PCI can work, HAL, BioArchive, etc., etc. And there are many supporters uh, who provide uh, symbolic support and also financial support. So many scientific societies, many institutes and universities, and uh, many uh, laboratories. So next slide, please. Uh, and the, the PCI uh, has a decoupled functioning because <coughs> There is a, a disconnection between the publication, the review, and the curation. So the authors, they first publish the article uh, by depositing their preprints in preprint servers. Second, they ask peer reviews to a PCI. Uh, um, and third, that can be a curation and endorsement by the PCI, for instance. But also, there is a possible transfer or submission to journals that can curate or endorse the PCI recommended preprints. And you can see in red here, the steps where this notify COA notification, uh, and Paul Walsh just talked about this, but for instance, uh, between the, the, the deposit on the preprint server and the submission to a PCI, there can be a notification uh, using the notify COA uh, model. Uh, between uh, the, the peer reviews of the PCI and the preprint server, there can be also a notification like the uh, we, using the model of no, no, notify COA, where the, the peer reviews will be notified to the, to the preprint servers. And also, if there is an endorsement or recommendation by a PCI or a transfer to a journal, that can be a notification to the preprint servers using this model of the notify COA notifications. Uh, please, next slide, Kathleen. Thank you. So, the, the functioning of PCI is hyper affordable. So, we try to do that at the maximum. Why? It's basically because it is based on preprints, which are very low costs. We use uh, in-house back and front offices with no commercial softwares. And all of this is a cloned and it is common to all of the PCIs. Uh, the scientific work of evaluation is completely decentralized because there are many, many volunteer scientists uh, working as associate editors. And the, the consequence of that is that the, the functioning cost of each PCI is absolutely low because it's less than 10,000 euros per year. And it is so low that there is no need for a cost for readers and for authors. So it's a free service to the readers and to the authors. And in addition, there is this option of using this Diamond Open Access Journal, uh, which is the peer community journal, with no cost again for the authors and the readers. So next slide, please. Uh, so the, the idea that PCI may be contributing to bibliodiversity is due to the fact that uh, there is um, a transparent evaluation of articles, and this is original in the uh, ecosystem of evaluation of articles. Uh, we decouple the evaluation of the publication, and also this is uh, quite original. 
Uh, we at PCI perform journal agnostic peer review that can be used by uh, many journals after, uh, after the evaluation. And we also encourage the use of preprints. Um, and there are two things that are uh, very original with PCI is that we publish a first kind of object, which are the editorial processes with the peer reviews, editorial decisions, etc. And we also publish a second kind of object, which are the recommendations that highlight the articles. And in fact, PCI is a journal publishing these two new objects. Uh, 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 um, and this is just the, the action of uh, the activity of PCI. And the idea is that uh, all these functions at no cost for the authors and readers, which is, we think, very inclusive uh, in terms of the dissemination and access to knowledge. Um, next slide, please. So. I think that, yes, so this is all. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would be pleased to answer any questions you have after that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas, uh, Paul, and Jean-Claude. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because it's hard to have all of these things in front of me. Um, we've got, <laughs> we have eight minutes and we've got a number of questions and comments. So what I'm going to do is focus on the questions, um, because I don't think we'll be able to get to everything in eight, the eight minutes. Um, so I'm going to start with this question, and I'm just going to ask one of you to respond to each of these questions. Otherwise, we will, won't be able to get through very many. Um, so perhaps um, I will throw this out to Jean-Claude, uh, this question. Or um, if Jean-Claude doesn't want to take it, then Thomas. Um, Mika Vandergriff asks, I'm curious about how the interest in bibliodiversity from the scholarly communications perspective is being paired or matched with similar movements outside of higher education. Are the partner opportunities or initiatives we can learn from or be better aware of? Are there? I must say I have not really explored that part of the question, so I, I don't think I have mm -hmm. much to say, except perhaps uh, that this whole bibliodiversity form of thinking has been, I believe, strongly influenced by the free software movement at some level. For example, the granularity of things being contributed and so on, but it's a minor part of the whole thing. So I'll let someone else respond to that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thomas, do you do you want to comment, or I I, I can comment mm, as well. Yeah, yeah. Go go on, Kathleen, because I have nothing yeah. to say on this topic. Yeah, I mean, I I guess for me, I think there are a number of parallels that we can look at. One, of course, is uh, biodiversity and the need to you know what's happening around ensuring, um, you know, trying to ensure biodiversity. Um, but I guess the other parallel I'm thinking of is the, the very strong trend in our societies now to try to protect it, to try to be more inclusive, protect, uh, 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 respect uh, diversity. And I think that's a, a parallel trend that we can look at and that, um, um, that helps very much make the case for why bibliodiversity is important because um, there's a much greater sensitivity and awareness about the need to be able to support diverse um, opinions, diverse peoples, uh, diverse cultures, and so on. Jean-Claude? Yeah, very briefly, I fully agree with you, Kathleen. Uh, I think as, at the metaphorical level, it works beautifully. The problem is that when you go at the conceptual level, it's much more difficult to make it, you know, in much more compelling and 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 so on. And I haven't made many big steps in that direction yet, if I ever do. Okay, thanks. Let's move on to um, and again, I'm going to focus on the questions rather than the comments. Please, I invite all the participants to read the comments in the Q and A and in the um, the chat. But I'm going to focus on the questions. So the next question is for Thomas specifically from Jerome Bozeman. What is yeah. the value added of PCI journals as compared to PCI reviewed preprints and the preprint servers? 
So I, I was starting to, to write it down, but I can do orally, it's, it's easier. So uh, in fact, scientifically, I think that there is no added value to the peer community journal, for instance. And there is no added value for an author to transfer uh, or to submit the article uh, to a PCI-friendly journal. It's just a solution to a very important problem currently, uh, which is the fact that the scientists currently, but really currently, they do need to have uh, publications in normal journals for their career, for the evaluation of their project, for to be hired by universities, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a kind of uh, very difficult situation currently where uh, um, a recommended and a peer-reviewed preprint is not enough, okay? And this is a problem that the, uh, the authors told us. So we decided to offer this solution and we hope this solution will only be temporary and that maybe in five or 10 years, a uh, preprint with, uh, with some peer reviews and with some endorsement will be absolutely enough for the scientists. And this is what we hope. Uh, about the second part of the question, which is the, uh, do the peer reviews are sustainably archived? So we, we uh, put all the peer reviews and the recommendations in clocks. So yes, they are they are archived for the future. Yes. Thanks, Thomas. Um, uh, this question from Tob Carpenter, I will um, uh, hand over to Paul. Um, is this process using Mecca standards to transfer the content object to other publishers? I think that might be a question for Thomas about PCI. Okay, um, perhaps. I mean, uh, the, the uh, last one, the last one yeah. of Todd Carpenter. It, yeah, it's not a question. It's a, it's a comment. Uh, no, so it says, not... is this process using the, the Mecca? I mean, I think, may I take an attempt to respond and then you can correct me if I'm wrong, Thomas, but there is no content moving around. Um, so, um, there is uh, so so it was a question for me. I, I did around. not understand, uh, Kathleen. The Mecca standard is for me. I don't know. Maybe so, Todd. So there, could, there, um, I can just say that there is no specific uh, mechanism to transfer uh, the peer reviews from PCI to journals. Uh, we just ask the authors to make this transfer when they submit to a journal. Okay, so no specific uh, notifications or mechanic uh, transfer, etc. Thanks, Thomas. Okay, um, so we've got a couple minutes left. Um, here's the next question um, by Arjun Sanyal to Jean-Claude. Has the UC Berkeley Elsevier face-off um, back in 2019? Uh, yeah. That I guess something did something to the big deal, um, create barriers in scholarly communication, her heralded a clarion call for rethinking the agenda of open scholarship. I, I would say no, actually. I, I mean, after all, the, the resistance to the big deal was starting already in 2001 when the, the director of libraries at Wisconsin wrote the famous paper about the prisoner's dilemma. And that's when uh, the, the big deal was viewed as a as something that was extremely deleterious. At the same time, one has to dissociate the big deal from the open scholarship. Uh, the big deal is a form of marketing. And uh, you could even imagine, after all, why not, having a big deal of, uh, of open access journals. I mean, there's no, there is no, nothing against that to be free and gratis rather than free, but it, would be, uh, it could be a big deal. It's a way to, to bundle things to achieve marketing clout or uh, power through marketing. The open scholarship is entirely different. The open scholarship is really opening up the whole notion of how knowledge is produced, how it is accessed, how the right to produce is distributed and how it is preserved, how it is disseminated and how it serves all of us and how it engages with all of us, both researchers and non-researchers. So it's an entirely different world from the, the big deal. The big deal just pushed out the fact that the big publishers were re really trying to use their weight and marketing clout to push their own journals, reinforcing the commodity or merchandise nature 
of those journals. So it's a different issue. Thanks. Thanks, Jean-Claude. Um, and on that note, I think we've come to the end of our one hour. Um, thanks again so much for our panelists, uh, for your contributions, for your insights, and for showing us your the projects that you're working on. Um, uh, thank you for all the participants and all the attendees. Um, uh, you've got some websites, uh, URLs, you can follow up on some of these projects and, and certainly get in touch with any of us at any time. So with that, uh, Osman, do I need to say anything else or just close? The uh, thank you very much for the panelists. Thanks to Kathleen for moderating and uh, managing this session and this panel. Uh, thank you very much and see you at the next, uh, the next session. It's starting now, actually. It's Thanks, a, everybody. A pleasure Bye. Pleasure to meet you, Osman. <laughs> pleasure thank to you. meet you, too. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye, you very Bye. much. Bye. Thank you.